you're struggling because you're trying to do it their way. And I was like, what if you did it your way? And she's like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can. And I was like, wait, have you tried? Why did I become an executive coach? I saw lots of great people fail to get ahead at work, while their much less talented peers blew right past them. That made me furious, but also curious. What were great people getting wrong? It came down to helping them re-examine what drove success and then helping them make critical shifts one hard truth at a time. Feel like you're doing everything you were told, but you're not moving ahead at work nor having the impact you seek? Then welcome to 97% Effective with Michael Winderoth, where we skip feel-good, happy talk and engage experts in pointed conversations about what it really takes to move the needle at work and your career. So if you feel stalled or frustrated or seek that extra edge as you move to the next level, then look no further. This is the hard truths playbook you never got. Hi, I'm Michael Wenderoth, and you're listening to 97% Effective. People often think about power as a hard force, one that flows from your position and authority. But if that were the case, my guest today rightly points out, then why can't leaders just snap their fingers and everything happens? Today, I'm excited to be joined by Julia Steele, keynote leadership speaker, author, facilitator, and coach. She wants you to expand how you think about power, and she's on a mission to help you become more influential to achieve your goals. We're going to look at her career and her work with organizations and leaders. We'll discuss how you find your power after powerlessness, how you unlock your team's hidden power, and the fine line between power and empowerment. Julia knows a thing or two about influence. Prior to becoming a speaker and coach, Julia served more than 15 years in blue chip companies as a project manager, consultant, head of transformation, and general manager. Arenas where influence without authority is essential to your success. She holds a bachelor's in management and computer science from the University of Kent, a master's in applied positive psychology from the University of Melbourne, and completed executive education at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. She's the author of the books Buy-In and Unite. They say a lot about the things that she does and are meaningful to her, and publishes the popular blog, whose name I absolutely love when I first got it, Nerves of Steel. Julia, thank you for connecting from Melbourne today. Congratulations, too, on juliasteel.com turning five years old earlier this year. And I'm excited about our conversation today. So welcome to 97% Effective. Thanks so much, Michael. Greetings from Melbourne. It's fantastic to be here. And I want to ask, five years, you, you made a big shift from corporate over to your coaching practice and speaking practice and building it, something I admire. We're going to talk about it. But just what are you feeling five years? Pretty proud. Like five years is a bit of a milestone. And there was like, like three years that that's been in a pandemic. And like how privileged am I to still have a business after that? Like it was some tough times for, for everyone, right? Um, but to, to be able to navigate um, the last few years, there's been a lot of coaching, a lot of leaders that have needed help. So that's been... Fabulous. Not so much speaking. Like there's, there's not been many physical stages to stand on. So I'm looking forward to get back into some of that too. It was challenging times, and we're going to talk about one of the things that you did that I thought was absolutely amazing. That really harnessed teams and bringing other people together created a really great platform and was very helpful. So, not going to spoil what that is. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. The theme here is around power and influence, and it is an area that uh, you very much uh, are passionate about and look at. And we both speak and coach around these topics. We see the understanding and harnessing of them as, as keys, uh, crit critical parts to getting things done, making an impact. And we both believe that people hold this very overly narrow view of those two concepts. So to start, how do you feel people get power and influence wrong and how, how do you define those concepts or encourage people you work with to think about them? 
I mean, you and I have spoken about this for years, right? We've known each other for five or six years now, and it's been a common topic of debate between us. And I think the biggest mistake I see people make is that they see power as like this zero-sum game. Like there's a certain amount of power that's available, and by me having more power, it means that you have less power. And I just think that's fundamentally flawed, right? We all have our own access to power and influence. And just because you have more than me, for his, for example, doesn't mean that, like, it feels adversarial, like combative. And I, I think a lot of that competition gets gets in the way of what we're actually really capable of if we put that to one side and say, well, what if we were both powerful? What do we, what do we both need to be able to influence the changes in the organisation that we, that we want to make? And I think this is a it's a really critical point because there is a whole school of thought and definitions that say power is a zero-sum game. So I think you open up a, a very interesting topic of how we can make things win-win people off better. And you know, as we talk about this, let's continue to to, to bring up this theme. I, I wanted to start with th- this case study, I'm gonna call it, <laughs> of Julia. And you know. You are an influencer. You're speaking and, and you're writing. And I remember if, if we dial back, speaking to you as you were you know, starting that journey, that transition to becoming a coach, and I really admired what you did and, and how you did it. And so I reached out to, as, you, as you were making this career pivot because I think you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's one thing a lot of people will say, ah, okay, yeah it's easy, right, to become an influencer, you have to do kind of stuff, but it's not. (laughs) It's a lot of being very strategic, experimenting, but doing things. A lot of people will say, but then the fear comes in, the reverting to comfort zone, and you do things. And I believe that many of the, the things you did were really creative, really made an impact. And I want to go to that example that we alluded to, what you did in the pandemic, a conference. I want you to talk about that more. I I, I won't explain it, but it was about how you harness the power of others. Mm -hmm. And again, I say, I'll go on a limb here a little bit, you know, that I think that's the core of what you're about, helping other people, right? Raise Mm -hmm. their voice, um, connect, unite them. And that unlocks kind of more power for everyone. So can you talk more about what you did and, and that piece, which is, I think, a great illustration? Yeah, sure. Look, before we get to there, I just want to talk about the exit from from exit from exit corporate because a lot of people have asked, you know, would you ever go back and why did you leave and what was it about it? And I remember it was actually Professor Pfeffer's class at Stanford, his power class. And I remember reading, I think I got five pages into his book, which I absolutely love. But he says something, and I'm not going to quote him exactly, but it says something along the lines of power is not for everyone. Like this game, this power game is not for everyone. And I realized at that point that I was just like, actually, I don't want to play power in the corporate game. I want to be able to create power and influence in my my own way. And so I'm not going to blame Professor Pfeffer for my exit for corporate. Um, If you you want to pass that message on, you can. But it was it was it was it was a moment for me where I was just like, actually, I'm playing a game I don't I don't want to play. And in this power powerlessness um, scenario, I was in a world where I where I was not powerless, but I was frustrated that I wasn't getting the traction that I was hoping to get in my career. And so by going out on my own. I was then able to say, okay, well, how do I want to influence? What are the conversations that I want to have? And so when the the pandemic came around, you know, a lot of coaches, a lot of speakers, we all know each other. And in the space of about a week, about, well, for me, it was about 75% of my business just disappeared, right? No one wanted speaking anymore. No one wanted training anymore. Um, everyone was everyone was sent home, and so I was I was out at dinner with a couple of friends. I think it was the last dinner we had before we got put into to lockdown. And we're talking about what are we going to do? And I was like, well, in in Australia, everyone had been told to go home by the by the government, and so I was like, okay, there's all of these people at home, and I know a whole lot of speakers, trainers, coaches that are suddenly available. What can I do to bring those two those two people those two groups of people together? And so I sort of put on my put on my project management hat and I was a bit ambitious and said, right, I'm going to put on a conference for a month um, and I'm going to start in three days. So this, I had the idea on the Friday and I told people that the conference is going to start on the following Wednesday. 
I said, there's no theme. The only content, like if you've got content you think people will want to hear from when they're, when they're at home, if it's relevant, feel free to, to chip in a session. So I went to eight of my nearest and dearest sort of speaker coaching buddies and said, hey, I've had this crazy, crazy idea for a conference. Do you want to come? So they, they very generously donated, you know, an hour of their time each. So I had one day and then they went to their mates who then went to their mates and who then went to their mates. And um, so we ended up, I think, had 174 speakers. We ran from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, every day for, all, for a month. And it just went, it just went crazy. Like there was, I think, a thousand people on the first session, then it became two thousand. And over the course of a month, I think we had fifteen thousand people from thirty-two countries um, just join that vid nineteen, that vid nineteen conference. What you said there about not playing the game and and kind of making that choice, and then creating, you know, the new environment that you wanted to operate in. And then I didn't know that you put that conference together on such a short, <laughs> I mean, that is totally leveraging the power of, of others and that network. So yeah. oh, I didn't know that backstory. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was pretty intense three days. You continued to run it as well, right? Yes. You continued to run it afterwards. Yeah. So it took on a life of its, of its own. On that theme, you have a very good blog piece around power and influence and I'm going to flip this and turn this a little on you because you cite Joseph Grenny and the three keys to being an influencer, focus and measure, find essential behaviors, and engage in the six sources of influence. And I'd love for you to step back and just analyze yourself on those keys. So, you know, what, what could we learn from you know, your application of these mm-hmm. to increase your influence? Yeah, I, look, I absolutely love this the book by Joseph Grenny. It's called Influencer. And what I what I love about it is it's actually um, rather than talking about what influence it is, is it's how do we actually what can we actually do to to influence? And it's it's um, if people don't have it, have it, go out and grab a copy because it's it's really interesting the different layers that he and and the other authors look at influence. But when I look at like focus and focus and measure. If I was to use vid, vid 19 as an example, like the focus was really clear. It's like it's a one month conference, and to be successful, I need speakers and I need audience members. Right? That that was regardless of all of the logistics of the events. They're the two things that I needed. So step one was right, I'm just going to put my my energy into finding really good speakers, and thankfully I know a lot of them. And then, but then also going well. What what's the measure? Okay, well, it's people coming through the door, right? And and the sense of fear and said fear and dread I had at that first session because I I could see a whole bunch of people are registered, right? But you never know how many people are gonna show up. But I remember going live in this first session. And I'm going, oh my god, what if no one, what if no one shows up? <laughs> <laughs> but there were, but then a whole you know thousand people came on that on that first day, and so by being able to measure that other speakers started to hear about it. Like it wasn't just this one-off webinar that I was doing. And so I did a pretty solid social campaign around the event as it was running, but just saying, you know, we've had eight speakers today, a thousand people came, created a sense that people were missing out on something. So then more people came and more speakers put up, put up their hand. I think the, the essential behaviors, like I'm fascinated by human behavior. And I think when, one of the mistakes that people make when it comes to power and influence is they make it about themselves and trying to influence rather than rather than the other person. And if someone's doing something that you don't expect, it's like what it, what is it that they're why are they doing it that way? Like why are they pushing back? Why are they not getting on board? Why are they making it personal? And so the essential behaviors for me for for vid nineteen, where it's like okay, there's a whole lot of people at home. What can I do to influence their behaviour and, and and get online? And so the sessions ran literally back to back. So people were um, one of my favourite testimonials from the event is I've been watch been watching this like Netflix. It was just <laughs> rather than you know watching watching Netflix, they were just watching these sessions back to back. And um, so that was yeah, getting getting people engaged and. But right, and this is right back at the beginning of um, the pandemic. So people w- weren't used to Zoom. They weren't used to chat. They weren't used to having their cameras on. So just finding ways to engage people 
in a, in a different medium and and helping them them do that was was sort of really really key and i think then maybe if i think about i won't touch on all of the six sources of influence in in granny's book but um i think the, the three that stand out for me is one is how do you help people love what they currently hate so for me people currently at the time people hated being at home right they didn't know what they were doing they didn't know how long they were going to be at home so actually just creating an environment that they loved to be part of. There was a lot that I did. So some speakers had never spoken online before. So I did a bit of coaching with them about, you know, how do they get online? Like actually helping enable them and supporting them to um, and encouraging them to, to get online. So rather than it being a barrier, it was sort of able to influence and welcome them, welcome them into the world of, of vid 19 I mean, you created an amazing platform there, and I would, you know, hearing you talk about that and diagnose, it's really interesting, and I, I'm sure you got tons of learning out of there too. As you as you kind of look back, and if you think if you did it again, like what might be one thing that you would change that you feel like would would even amplify it more? So I kept it really simple. So it was just literally Zoom webinar register. Afterwards, people said, "Oh, wait, you know, why didn't you stream it on YouTube, and why didn't you put it out?" You know, why didn't you record and edit the videos? And there was a whole lot of complexity and, and and suggestions that people, like great suggestions, but would have been added added complexity. And I think if if I had my time again or, or more, maybe more time to do it, you know, I could have got a, you know, a production team to help or, you know, I could have made it, I don't know, sexy is the right word. Like I could have you know, made it a bit more high end, but I actually don't know if it needed it for what what we were creating um, at the time. And I think, um, you know, some speakers said, you know what, unless, unless you're paying, I'm, I'm not interested. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Like I respect, I respect that. Um, I did, an, I did the same conference the, the year after and actually it was, that was ticketed. The first one I did was free. And I don't know if it being a paid event helped or not. Like I liked that it was, that it was free and that people were joining, for all the right reasons, not because they were just, you know, either being paid to be there or that they had paid to attend. So I'm not sure there is much I would I would change. Um, maybe get more sleep, slightly slightly fewer sessions. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the binge watching of where it automatically comes next. I, I'm, I'm envisioning yeah. that visual that you say of uh, Netflix was probably pretty powerful. Yeah, a few people said to me afterwards, I should have spoken more. So, because I did sort of turn myself inadvertently from being a speaker into a host or an M- or an MC, so maybe I could have spoken more. But again, that's not. I created a different kind of power by bringing people together, as opposed to the conference being about myself and other people. Yeah. People coming. So. Yeah. So these core topics that that we wanted to also talk about finding your power after powerlessness. And this is a great example when COVID hit and all this uncertainty has occurred these last three years. So certainly no shortage of examples of how things have been upended. Can you speak about the, the process by which people find their power or, or even you know, an example of how you've helped someone do this? Yeah, sure. I think the reason that I'm so passionate about power and influence is there have been times in my life where I've had none. Like we haven't actually spoken about this together, but I, I have a Me Too story from when I was 16. And if you want to talk about what powerless feels like, that's that's kind of it in its worst, right? It's fear, doubt, shame, like all of these terrible, terrible words. So when I when I talk about power, it's not because I've necessarily why well, I'm working on my own, but I've also come from being this this sense of powerlessness. And I was coaching someone someone last year who's been new, newly promoted and I was talking to her about you know why why was she struggling to find her power and she felt powerless because she wasn't yet newly promoted she was in a role where there were quite expectations of what quite high expectations about what she was there to do how she was meant to operate and there were a lot more experienced people around her so she was felt like she was being judged and critiqued in every every turn 
And we just sort of sat down and said, well, you know, you're, you're struggling because you're trying to do it their way. And I was like, what if you did it your way? And she's like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can. And I was like, wait, have you, have you tried? So we sort of go, okay, well, what does the, the outcomes are really clear? What's her version of getting to those, those outcomes? And, and how does she actually do it from an authentic place as opposed to trying to do the work in a way that other people expect her expected her to and I think a lot of us a lot of us make that mistake like we see people higher up the chain or people that are more experienced and we say okay well it worked for them so it'll work for me and then it's like but that's not that's not true if you're desperately unhappy doing it and so yeah a lot of the coaching conversations I have particularly with women how do you lead in a way that you want to lead like being a powerful woman is very different to being a powerful man the outcome's the same, but what we do to get there is different. For me, power is about authenticity. It's showing up the way that you want to show up. Is making a difference in the way that you want to make. Um, and so, yeah, in that in that particular example, um, you're working working with with a client. It was yeah, let's break it down. What what do you? How do you want to make a difference? And what are you? What are the steps that she can take to do that in an authentic way? And then as soon as she starts taking those steps and confidence builds and belief builds and then you know before you know it you you sort of looking back and go how did that how did that happen (laughs) yeah and does this you have this phrase on your website that that I found really powerful stand up step up show up and it almost what you were describing there sounds like that process that people go through Are, are there other elements there that are worth calling out yeah I think it's so the stand the stand up piece is well we all so many of us want to make a difference right but we can we can go really really wide and and you know shallow or we can go really narrow and and deep so what is it that we want to stand up and sort of say I'm the person you know that wants to lead this change or make this difference that and then once we know that like every if you think about everyone that's powerful or that we would associate with power. They've all sort of got this flag that they're that they're flying in, in in some way. Some of them are more obvious than others, but they're all flying a flag. So, what do we want to stand up for as leaders? And then once we know that, how do we how do we step up and, and take the steps that we need to take it? And you know, I think power and influence is so esoteric. Like people can't touch and feel it, so they don't know how to do it. But it's an output of taking the steps that you need to take to, to get it. Yeah, and this part of the, the show up, it, it, it immediately made me think of, I increasingly find it quite frustrating or annoying, right, when you hear this executive presence used a lot. And it, it particularly when, when I, for example, if I'm doing a 360 review and I will get he or she doesn't have executive presence. And it's like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> Seems to be this narrow definition or or context specific in an organization what that might look like but I, what you what you submitted there really sounds like you know presence can mean different things and the kind of show up do you get this executive presence kind of coming and and how do you help people either define it or yeah. think about it all the time all the time it's a bugbear of mine too i'm like what does that mean yeah. like what, and what i find is when people are talking about executive presence they're actually talking about charisma I don't think that's all it is, though, because when I look at particularly the conversations I have in show up, show up it to me is how do you show up every single day? So if this is your flag that you're flying. This is the difference that you want to make, um, you know, increased sales, revenue, customer performance, whatever it is that you want to you want to fly your flag on. You have to. It's not a well. This is my flag day one, and then by day five, it's a different flag. Or, <laughs> you know, it's we've got to show up every single day, particularly for the big changes, right? There's so much complexity and uncertainty that we can't be hot and cold, right? We have to be, you know, consistent, show up um, with power and influence, with energy and enthusiasm, all of those things that, that great leadership that is. But, you know, show up I see so many leaders that are hot and cold um that that they're they're fantastic 
one day and then the next day they're having, you know, rabbit ears, a bad day. Um, and then people will start to question, you know, are they really up to it? And and showing up, I think if we want power, consistent power and influence, we have to show up consistently. And that's hard to do if you're not... I know we've had a lot of discussions on authenticity. We don't have that. But, it, you know, if you're constantly acting or not being who you are, it's very hard to do that, like you say, consistently day in and day out, which is critical if you're leading others or that energy seeps over to them. Yeah, so I think that's a very, very good point. You've been listening to 97% Effective with your host, executive coach Michael Winderoff. If this interview is making you think, make sure to share it with a friend. Now, back to our interview. The other part, Julia, that you really talk about, it, it's, a, it's a big piece that you speak on too, is unlocking your team's hidden power. And leaders get stuff done through other people, right? They can't do things themselves, particularly as organizations get, get larger. So this goes to that point you bring up about being influential. We have touched on this a little bit, but but again, this getting others, the team, are, is there a, a, a piece you find often people get wrong or miss when they're thinking about unlocking the power of others? Yeah, there, there's, there's one that is by far the biggest standout for me, and particularly for you know new managers or emerging leaders, that they confuse influencing what with how. And so I see so many so many leaders trying to influence how something's done, you know, within their team. And I was like, you don't need to influence them on how it's done. Focus your time and energy on what what needs to be done and give them the space, the autonomy to figure out how to do it. And it's this sort of old traditional command and control is like, yeah, we've got to know what's do- what, what's happening, how it's being done, when it's going to be done, who's doing it. You know, it, it, like we were, if we were making a cup of tea, right? We want to know when the tea bag's gone in, when the sugar's gone in, when the milk's gone in, when the kettle's been boiled. We want to know all of it. But it's just like that's. It's two things. One is, as a leader, you're in the weeds, um, as we say down down here in Australia, you're in the weeds. So you're actually trying to influence stuff that's not important. Like you're, you're missing the bigger, the missing you're missing the bigger game when you're in the weeds. But also you're you're taking away your team's opportunity to build their power and influence, right? So, yeah, the, the, the one thing I say to just about every leadership team I coach or a leader I coach is focus on what needs to be done, put your power and influence there, put your energy there, and, and give your team the freedom and the autonomy to work on, to work on the how. That's super simple, And it goes to your point all around empowerment. You know, as a leader, you are empowering and great organizations, right? They're sharing information. They are collaborating. People are working as a team. But I know this is another, if you use the word bugbear, it's a a piece that really frustrates me and and why I work with individuals is because a lot of team players in a lot of organizations, let's not say all of them, Mm -hmm put everything in, they do great things for the organization, and they get taken advantage of. Either, and we see lots of very good research here, right? You know, we attribute one person has led this. Mm -hmm. Men and women co-write an article. The man gets the credit, no matter where they are in the list. And then, of course, there can be nasty politics where certain people are back-channeling, you know, saying certain things to alter perceptions. (sighs) And so I guess the, you can look at this from how do you structure things so that doesn't go on, but also what do individuals do? Mm-hmm. So on either of those fronts, kind of what can we do to structure and make sure that stuff doesn't happen? Or what do you do as an individual so your your power doesn't get taken away from you? Mm-hmm. I've been guilty of being too helpful in the past. It was actually a piece of feedback I got when I was still in corporate that I was too helpful for my own good. Mm-hmm. And Isn't that suck to hear that? It does. It does. It's like... You want me to be less helpful? It's like, what is that the message? <laughs> is that the message here? But anyway, I won't go into I won't go into that. But it's like, yeah, I've been too helpful for my for my own good. And I think if I was to use the the stand up, step up, show up, when we're not really clear on what it is that we want to stand for, 
we help in lots of other ways. Like if you and I were writing a report or you needed um, my input on something, I would be helpful and I would provide, you know, I would help you. But if it's not something that I really want to take a stand on, then take the credit, right? I, I think sometimes we're a bit too sensitive. Like we associate our effort with with recognition, whereas actually you go, what do I really want to what do I really want to take a stand for? And and then having the courage and the guts to go, I'm, I'm I would like to lead this, and so that people know from the outset that you're not just you know another pair of hands, that you're not just chipping in a bit of time and energy because for the for the fun of it, that you actually want to sort of grab the bull by the horns and say this is this is what um, I'm passionate about. I'd love I'd love to lead it, and it's I'm amazed how many people don't ask. They, they complain they cl- complain about it when they don't get the recognition at the end, but they never asked for the role in the, in the first place. And I don't want to, that to sound too cruel, um, but when I, when I reflect on when I reflect on my career, I'm like, yeah, I should have I should have put my hand up or I should have pushed harder fr- from the outset rather than let momentum and things play out and then wonder why I didn't get the result that I was was hoping for and you know, there, there are you know, as you said there's lots of research in in particularly the difference in in genders and and for the women that are listening I would really just say just ask you know put your hand up you are as capable as um, your male peers to to be you know at the table writing reports making decisions leading change and that we shouldn't just be the helpful support behind the scenes. Yeah. So ask, and there's this wonderful quote, Alice Walker, that I'm very fond of is that, you know, people give away their power by thinking they don't have any. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your part here, but I think that, that it's, and we, you know, make the ass sometimes gets overused, but you very much connect that to the have the stand, Mm -hmm. right? For the stuff I'm really, really passionate about, this is what I, this is what I, this is what I want to take a stand on and this is what I want to be known for. And, um, yeah, it's thinking, thinking about that up front and, and, and also being realistic, right? Power, power and influence is a game to some people and you've got to look at, you know, look around what's going on, what, what, what are the games that are being played and be honest with yourself about, you know, some people listening might be playing those games. Um, other people might need to learn to play the game a little bit better. Yeah. So this part around games, and as, as we think about organizations, right, you are working with other people. And this goes to one of the topics that, that I think we're both very passionate about, which is trust. We're both big fans of, of, of <laughs> Stephen Covey. Yeah. So trust is really essential, right, to, to getting things, you know, done and done well and collaborating to this part. And we have talked about, you know, standing up and asking, but are there also you know, additional practical advice you might give for those who maybe are a little too trusting, you know, signs they should be looking for as you, should I go into this company? Should I go into this type of relationship? Should I join that team? If, if I know those people, you know, and you don't always know <laughs> no, you don't. up front. So it's like, what are the detectors we kind of need out there to take care of ourselves in environments that, that may not always be high trust? Yeah. I, I mean, you mentioned coffee. I'm really I'm a huge fan of um, Stephen M. R. Covey's book, The Speed of Trust. It's on, been on my bookshelf for many, many, many years and regularly gets taken off of it. And it's something that I give to a lot of my coaching clients too. And the reason I love it is he breaks it down into four things. One is integrity. The other is intent. Then there's capability. And then I think the last one is results. And it's a really useful filter for me and I know a lot of my coaching clients like it too because you go okay you can look at a person you can look at a team you can look at an organization you can go okay do they have integrity like am am I getting a sense that that they're doing things for the right reason um, that it comes from a good moral place um, that it's you know their values align with my values you know that we're trying to you know get to the same goal you know, is it clear on what the intent is that they're trying to achieve? Like, I'm amazed at, you know, how many organizations say, you know, we're all about customer. And then as soon as you get into a customer, it's all about bottom line, or it's all about, you know, so what is the intent behind 
the relationship and um, if you're trying to do one thing and someone else is trying to do something else, then it's not going to work. So how do you get to that shared that shared understanding, um, shared intent, clear goal? I think a lot of trust falls over, um, certainly when I work with teams, around capability. So we have grand plans, but then we don't trust each other to do it. Um, some of that is because we're not capable of or we've never done it before or it's hard or we need to figure stuff out. Um, so, you know, uh, if you're giving people or giving someone a piece of work to do, are they capable of doing it? Um, and likewise, if someone gives you a piece of work, you know, are you capable of doing it? And then I think a lot of a lot of trust is actually measured by results, right? To me, trust is a circle, right? You have trust, you do work, hopefully it works out well, and then you get more trust. And then you get given more work, if you do it right, you'll get more results and you'll get more trust. So it's it's this cycle. So in all of the work that we're doing, results have to come out of the other side, and that's what builds that what that's what builds momentum. Um, but yeah, I, I when I when I look at individuals on teams, I'm like, yeah, are they getting the results? If they're not getting the results, like I I, I take the four things and then I work it back. Are they getting the results? If they're not getting the results. Why aren't they getting the results? Is it a capability gap, a skill gap, a culture gap, a process gap? What is it? What is it that's missing? And then and then work my way back through you know intent and integrity. And uh, it's hard, right? Everyone says they want it, but it's another one of those amorphous. We know what trust looks like. We know what it doesn't look like. But getting from one to the other takes time and time and work. Yeah, this part around taking ton of work. And, and I, I would just add one nuance on this because I also think about this a lot. And, and the person who's influenced me a lot is Rod Kramer at, at Stanford and who looks at this in organizations. And, and so he's fond of talking about temper your trust as part of kind of incrementally building it and seeing it. Yeah. Because, and I had, had an interesting discussion about this as well, that we think we can detect, right? lying and devious behavior, but we're not always as good at it. If you look at many ways that people can build influence, you know, simple markers or affiliations, and, and so we'll sometimes make false assumptions there or we'll be kind of duped by it. And it's not to say that this is going on constantly, but that kind of triangulating and looking a little closer and, and building it, I think, is, a, is another piece that I've, I've learned a lot from, from, from Rod on that. Yeah, and, it, and it's... And what's the saying? It takes a lifetime to get it, a minute to lose, right? So it's some people, I, I think of some fantastic leaders I've had that the trust was mutual. I have, I've had look at other leaders that I've had where I've trusted them or, you know, but they're micromanaging and I'm like, well, what, you know, don't you trust me? And what, you know, so it, it's complex and it's, but it's so, so important. And I think um, reflecting on even, how much do you trust yourself? Like I, I think a lot of us have are increasingly given bigger and bigger shoes to fill and bigger or higher bars to clear. And then sometimes we just need to have an honest conversation with ourselves. It's like, well, you know, does this really align with what I'm trying to do? Am I capable of doing it? And I, I, I sometimes feel that we set ourselves up for failure rather than success because we don't say, hey, I haven't done this before. Um, or... I'm, I'm really good with this piece, but it would be great if I could get some help with this piece. Um, and instead, because we don't have those courageous conversations, we, we barrel on and then before we know it, the wheels, the wheels have fallen off. And then we're back, we're back to square one. Well, not even, maybe even worse, not even square one, maybe even minus one um, in terms of, of where, where we are and the trusted relationships we have. Yeah. So the, that final topic, you, you've written about the fine line between power and empowerment. And, and what, what do you mean by this? Can you say more about that? Yeah, so I think I, I'm doing a lot in systems science at the moment, doing quite a lot of reading around us, out, like us as individuals and then our, our, us in the system. And I think power is sometimes seen as this individual um, endeavour, like it's, I have power, you have power. And when I think back about um, Vid19 and the book that I wrote, Unite, this, this I'm really interested in the, the idea around this collective 
power, like when we all come together and it's not a zero-sum game and we're all bringing the power that we have to the table, can we do much bigger, much bolder things than one person with power doing it, doing it on their own? And so for me, I think there's a fine line between what, when I look at teams I've led, I can have power, but there's a fine line between that being command and control power and empowering them and you know, for some of the challenges that are, that are happening in the world at the moment, they're not going to be solved by one person, right? They, they're going to be solved by many, many people. And so the the fine line that we have to walk as leaders is, yeah, you, leveraging the power that we have, but then also empowering others around us so that, yeah, the collective is is greater than any, any one person. Hmm. Yeah, that takes us full circle kind of from the narrow definition zero sum to this idea of collective power and the only way you really get that is 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 collaborating empowering others yeah 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 like you look at how how movements have started you look at some of the mm-hmm. enormous social changes that have been made you look at activists that have come from no like nowhere or seemingly nowhere but are sort of that by every traditional definition of power shouldn't have power because they're too young or a certain gender or a, diff- a certain demographic, yet they're, because they're being able to harness the, the power and the energy um, around them, they're doing, they're doing amazing things. And I just, I just think that's a fascinating way to look at power in the future or what power looks like in the future versus what we've traditionally called it in the past. Very provocative to think about. Julia, any, any final question here that I didn't ask we didn't get time to and you've got some fire around that you feel like we should have at least brought up here no I think I, we could keep talking about this all day Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think one thing and, and and I will say this because I am I am in Australia and the the difference in cultural associations with power like it's not something we we necessarily have time to explore but I, I do go like in Australia, power is different to power in America, which is different to power in India or Pakistan and the, the Asian subcontinent. And I've been really, really surprised at some of the influence our cultural origins have. And yeah, that it that it's it's not this Western view of power isn't necessarily all that power is. And if you take take a bigger lens there's pockets well great pockets of power in eastern and then there's not so great pockets like we can see the best and the worst of power when we look across across the world so um yeah if you take it out of organization and go to society i think it's really really interesting as well yeah i'm totally fascinated by that as well we'll have to have another discussion (laughs) Uh, around that because I, I feel like <laughs> I'm an American, but it's been like 27 years outside of it, mostly in, in China and um, here in Europe. Yeah. So I almost have to kind of look back at the States and kind of relearn and, and a lot of those, a lot of those pieces. Yeah. It, it is a, it's a fascinating topic. So let's, let's carry on that discussion. Julia, first of all, thank you again for joining me. I'm glad we could make this work. How do people learn more about you your work, your books, and working with you? Yeah, everything's at juliastill.com. I'm on LinkedIn like everyone else as well. So I'm a, you and I know that we're pretty active poster and sharer of ideas. So if people want to look me up on LinkedIn, it'd be great to connect. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for listening to 97% Effective, where we skip happy talk and help you break through and ascend one hard truth at a time. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, you can get free resources, including the first chapters of Michael's book, Get Promoted, on his website, www.changwinderoth.com. That's www.changwinderoth.com.